Okay, so Charles and James are not going to be joining, so I'm going to hang up on them. Ah, finally we get to hang up on those guys. Yeah. We get to do rogues our way. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't so know what my way just... is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, crap, our way is to have Chuck and, and Josh and James have a list of questions ready to go. <laughs> Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. This podcast is sponsored by New Relic. To track and optimize your application performance, go to rubyrogues.com slash new relic. This episode is sponsored by SendGrid, the leader in transactional email and email deliverability. SendGrid helps eliminate the cost and complexity of owning and maintaining your own email infrastructure by handling ISP monitoring, DKIM, SPF, feedback loops, white labeling, link customization, and more. If you'd rather focus on your business than on scaling your email infrastructure, then visit www.sendgrid.com. This episode is sponsored by Code Climate. Code Climate's new security monitor alerts you immediately when vulnerabilities are introduced into your Rails app. Sleep better knowing that your data is protected. Try it free at rubyrogues.com slash codeclimate. It's the Ruby Rogues podcast. This is episode 134. Today we have... Katrina Owen. Hello. And David Brady. I just want to be on the blooper reel. I am Avdi Grimm from RubyTapas.com. And uh, joining us on the panel today, we have Lucas Doman. Hello from Germany. So um, I think we have a little tiny bit of business to get out of the way before we get into the episode. Oh, yes, um, yes. We, a little piece uh, of awesome business. Awesome business, yes. <laughs> we finally have T-shirts. Uh, we've, we've got a uh, we've got a limited run of t. I, I think it's a limited run, right? It's a limited time thing, anyway. Uh, t-shirts you can get them at booster.com/rubyrogues, and they're pretty awesome looking. Uh, I think we're all pretty happy with the design that we wound up with. And uh, yeah, go get them before they run out. So our guest, as I said, is Lucas Doman, and he's here to talk about a bunch of different stuff. Um, but let's talk about the backstory here. Uh, about uh, I don't know a year or so ago, we had a little contest. David, can you can you fill us in again on on what that contest was? Well, I had this horrible idea like two years ago to run a Ruby in a tweet contest for the Ruby Rogues listener. I asked all the listeners to write in the coolest thing you could do in Ruby in a single tweet, and it was a horrible idea because we ended up getting like a hundred responses and then we had to judge them and it just never start a contest. If you're not willing to just judge all of the entries because uh, <laughs> it it's, it's horrible. Uh, I know, I know cry you a river. Right. But uh, some of the responses that we got uh, were just fascinating. And we, we judged on various criteria such as how astonishing was it? How cool of a thing was it? Was it really useful? And then we kind of had like a fourth category for just how much surprise and delight was there. And Lucas is Moonbeam Labs on Twitter, and he submitted two uh, entries. And one was a complete working to-do list app, which was mind-boggling. And the other one was this little animated ASCII art called Shark Time, where this little ASCII shark eats a swimmer. And it is way more fun than it has any right to be. And to, to the point that I keep Shark Time in my bin folder on my workstation so that I can run it anytime I feel like it's Shark Time. And um, I run it easily once a month just because something awesome will happen. And I'm like, woo, it's Shark Time. Let's go. So this has been very happy. You've made it into my permanent tool chain. So yeah, I think uh, so. So we said that, that uh, whoever whoever won this challenge would get to join us on the show, and uh, so here we are, like much belatedly, but yeah. Uh, so this was like what eighteen months ago. <laughs> was, yeah. You said it was May of two thousand twelve. So yeah, back back then you um said that you will judge us in like episode so and so, and then the episode came and nothing happened. Yep. And then we asked over, uh, I think, uh, their parlay was, uh, on Google groups back then. And we mm-hmm. asked, uh, where, uh, is the announcement of the winners? Mm-hmm. And there was the problem that 
it wasn't easy to find all those entries because Twitter uh, had yeah kept off yeah. the number of tweets you can find with a certain hashtag. So. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, by I the think. time we by the time we got around to judging, Twitter was hiding some of the evidence, and so we had to ask people for links to their own tweets again. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so uh, it was kind of a little delay, I think. Yeah. Uh, and the Actually, other winner was on, uh, I think, four episodes ago or five ep- episodes ago. Yeah, Eric. Yes, right. So actually what really happened there is that behind the scenes, I went to, you know, Abdi and Josh and Chuck and, 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 and James and said, I think some of the participants are German and they get really wound up about punctuality. So <laughs> how about we wait for like eight months before we do anything? <laughs> and they all thought it was just a great idea. And so. Yeah, sounds like a great yeah, idea. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> so. Yeah, so um, the the Shark Tank one, uh, this this was an ASCII art I drew back in school. Then um, we we um, explored ASCII uh, ASCII arts, and this was one of the first ASCII arts I drew. And uh, when the when the golf contest came up, I thought mm, maybe you can animate this. And the first version, yeah, it really didn't fit into a tweet. Mm-hmm. So uh, I yeah, golfed it down step by step. And uh, yeah, after a while, now it it works, and now it can swim and eat a swimmer. So that's <laughs> kind of awesome. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun when you take something that is like y- you shrink it down as small as you can, and it's like 400 characters long, right? And you're like, there is no way this is going to fit into a tweet. And then you start using side effects, and you start, you know binning things down and you start lowering resolution of your solution and and that sort of thing and i remember what what inspired me to suggest the golf contest is that i had been uh, at work the previous year and i'd been exploring mandelbrot fl- uh, fractals and i realized that i had figured out a way to express the mandelbrot fractal in 300 characters and mm-hmm. i started talking to people about how can we shorten this how can we shorten this and I got it down to like 134 characters, which was enough to get it into a tweet. And I published it, and people ran it, and it was just a text version of the Mandelbrot Fractal because it was all done on the console. And people started replying to me and said, oh, you missed this optimization. And within 24 hours, people had it down to like 108 characters. <laughs> it was yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, I... I uh, the to-do list, um, the version that's on uh, Twitter, uh, we optimized it on our user group here. Uh, mm-hmm. We sat down with three people and we uh, shaved off like eight or ten characters uh, nice. from the current version. So uh, right now it's even smaller. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, there are a lot of dirty uh, areas in Ruby which you can use in such a situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in normal situations, you don't want to use those things mm-hmm. because they are kind of ugly and um, yeah. They don't make your code really readable or awesome at all. <laughs> but uh, if you want to golf, then it's really nice. I, I think there's even a, a program language called Golf uh, Lang, I think, oh, cool. which is just done for golfing. So <laughs> that's uh, awesome. Isn't that uh, called Perl? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah. <laughs> or or, or J Lang. Yeah. yeah, Jay Lang is crazy. There, there was a the a golfing contest at a conference uh, here, a local conference, and there uh, was a special area for um, for those people doing uh, J programs because they are so ridiculously small, uh, mm-hmm. because everything is just random characters. <laughs> uh, they yeah. had, uh, no one can read it, um, yeah. but yeah, it's kind of short. <laughs> yeah, everyone else at the golfing contest, they have to fit their submission into a single tweet. Everybody at the J-Lang golfing contest has to fit their submission into a username. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be fair, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lucas, you're a, you're a pretty busy guy, aren't you? Tell us yeah, a little bit I... about some of the stuff that you're you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing um, kind of a lot of stuff. I don't think I sleep a lot. <laughs> Maybe that's not healthy. So um, I'm working for a company in, in uh, Cologne, uh, which is called Triagens. And uh, we are doing an open source NoSQL database uh, that's called ArangoDB. And I'm yeah part of the core team there. And yeah, that, that means that I'm uh, doing stuff on the database itself, which is mainly in JavaScript uh, from, for my part, because there's a V8 engine running in there and all the um, yeah, all the stuff I do is in JavaScript, but uh, because I love Ruby, uh, I also do the Ruby driver. Uh, so everything Ruby related uh, for ArangoDB um, is done by me. 
and I'm also studying computer science. <laughs> I'm getting finished with my master degree right now. So that are the two yeah, most time consuming things I do right now. <laughs> So you also mentioned some local activities. You, you you run a user group, did you say? Oh no, um, the, I'm I'm participating in different re- user groups, but I'm not running a user group. Um, but I uh, run a website for local, uh, yeah, for local user groups. So uh, it's easier for people to find a user group in the city. It's an open source project uh, that's community driven and you can just go to the site and see what can I do this evening and currently it's running in um, two cities in Germany so in Cologne where I live and uh, in uh, Berlin where a friend of mine lives and um, yeah so in those cities if you want to find out what a nerd can do today uh, you can just go to the website and find out <laughs> you mentioned you're working on a, a database a Rango DB mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm I'm curious about that. I've run across it, uh, mentions of it a few times, but I never really dug into it. What are the things that makes that make it stand out from some of the other offerings out there? So, um, what is made the 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 first thing that you will see, which is different from other databases, is that it combines both a document store and a graph database. So, if you take Mongo for example, and then you want to uh, model how people are connected, it will get a little bit awkward because there are no joints there and then you have to work with uh, references and so on. And we decided that it would be a nice combination if you could also do the things that you can do in a graph database because, yeah, a graph database is really good in connecting uh, certain entities. So uh, you have documents, for example, you have people and they have certain attributes and they can be nested as in other uh, document stores. But uh, then you can add edges uh, in another collection, which can again have uh, different attributes. So they could be, um, if uh, the relationships are friendships, then um, you could set the intensity of the friendships um, to a certain number, uh, for example, on the edge, because it's a normal document. And then you can um, yeah, model all the things that you could do in a, thing, uh, in a database like Neo4j and hmm. iterate over the database. So a graph database sounds... I haven't played with them a lot. I've touched them a little bit. And the way you've just described a graph database, it sounds like it's a way of doing SQL relationships in a document store right up until you said you could weight the edges. And Mm -hmm. that makes it sound like you can do a whole lot more. And and I'm aware that you can do a whole lot more with with a graph database, but I kind of want to give this hand this one over to you what are some of the like crazy awesome cool things that you can do with a graphing database or a graph so, database sorry uh so back back in university i um worked uh, at a yeah at a chair there and i worked for people that do network analysis and they used an oracle database and uh, db2 and we had to do graph analysis on those data so um I have written some crazy SQL statements uh, to analyze graph data that is stored in a, a relational database. And it's not a lot of fun because you have to join a lot and then you have to do recursive uh, joins and so on. And it mm-hmm. gets really messy really fast. And if you look into the source code of uh, those projects we did in uh, at the chair, then you will see a lot of cursing in uh, in the mm-hmm. comments in, uh, at each line because everyone just goes crazy uh, after mm-hmm. the third join. And mm-hmm. um, if you have a graph database, there are ways that you can articulate what you want to know from the database in a more distinct way because uh, you can, for example, just um, say, okay, I want a path of an arbitrary length between... Uh, to people or I want to know which people if we take a social network because it's the most simple example I think you can say okay uh, how many people uh, do I have to ask until I reach David Brady Mm -hmm. because there are friendships uh, in the graph and then I can ask Tom and then Jerry and then I will reach uh, you uh, and I have the shortest path to you and if you imagine to do that in a SQL database it is possible but it's a lot of pain to implement it. So, now, wouldn't um, a wouldn't a good graphing database 
if you tried to reach me through the shortest path, wouldn't it automatically raise an error saying, why would you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, probably should. Okay. It's, it's dangerous. Yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, we haven't implemented that feature yet. Maybe we can add it to mm-hmm. the list. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Thanks for the input. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, to be to be fair, I don't like uh, I don't like systems that protect the user from hurting themselves. So, <laughs> so that's fair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you are you're getting your master's degree in computer science. Yeah, that's true. What are you working on? So um, I'm currently not working on uh, my master thesis yet. Okay. So this will start in March. Right now, I'm finishing off my last lectures, and uh, yeah. I haven't chosen so wisely this semester, I think, but yeah, <laughs> you always know that like two months in and then you can't change it anymore. But uh, for my for my master's degree, I will also do something uh, for ArangoDB. Oh, cool. So another thing that uh, I'm working on there is uh, a system to implement APIs directly on top of the database. So uh, this is a kind of crazy idea and most people that he- hear it first, they say yeah, that doesn't sound like a good plan, but you can do some nice things if, if your um, database has a flexible API that you can uh, redefine and add things to. So you okay. can use this uh, behind your Ruby application because it shouldn't communicate so much between those two, uh, between your database and your application layer. Mm-hmm. But you could, in theory, also uh, communicate directly from the browser um, if you like to do that. Oh, wow. So are you talking about an API that Talks HTTP? Yes, right. That's cool. Elasticsearch does that, and that creates a lot of joy. Yeah, I, I, I think so, too. So our standard uh, API is also HTTP, and it helps a lot because you, you can just um, see what you're doing, and you can use all your normal tools that you have in your toolbox for HTTP. So, uh, for example... For the gem I wrote uh, that connects you to the database, I can uh, choose from all those uh, fancy HTTP libraries, uh, and using Faraday, I can just switch between them, and the user can say, okay, I really want this gem uh, to communicate with the database, and the other user can choose a different one because maybe he or she is using JRuby. So uh, if this would be a binary protocol, I would have to implement all of this by myself, which wouldn't be a lot of fun, I think. I think we're we're kind of in an era where there is a lot of skepticism about the value of a traditional computer science education when it go, comes to going into software engineering. Yeah, and I will I will definitely uh admit to being the source of some of that skepticism myself. What can you tell us about your experience with com- computer science education? Yeah, so I um, I have this discussion a lot, and people ask me if I'm crazy because I'm doing computer science. Uh, I could just earn money instead, but I think that uh, there are two reasons why this confusion exists. The first reason is that computer science and programming are just two different things, and they are related, but there are a lot of difference between them. So I'm really interested in the science of computers. So. I learn different things every day. I probably will never use it in my day job. But, <laughs> that was that's uh, one of the things I was wondering is if, if you found applications for it. Yes, there are there are not a lot of things. Um, so in the in the first uh, first two or three years of my studying, I think most of this what I learned I can't apply it in any kind of way. So from all those lectures I uh, visited, there were only two or three where we did programming at all. And mm-hmm. all others, they just assume that you can program, mm-hmm. which is not true for all the students, but okay. <laughs> so from the practical point of view, there's not a lot that you can take with you. But for example, all the things I learned about graphs, uh, I learned at, um, at university and mm-hmm. I think that if, um, I would just, I, I wouldn't have done my studying. I probably wouldn't have looked at graphs. So, um, it's, yeah, it gives you the the chance to look at things that you probably wouldn't look at just by yourself. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there's value in that. And maybe not everything needs to be really important for your entire life. But things like regular expressions, uh, understanding the inner working of a regular expression and what the basis of it is, is quite interesting. And yeah, understanding Turing machines and uh, maybe the... Understanding what a computer can't do, 
I think that's uh, valuable and I don't think everyone needs to do that. Uh, absolutely not. I think that you can be an excellent programmer without uh, ever studying, but I think it's interesting and you can learn a lot that's just, yeah, maybe you can use it one day, maybe you won't, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's nice to I, know it. I can imagine that it opens a lot of doors to interesting problems that you wouldn't meet if you're just doing web development. Yeah, yeah. I was watching a TED talk the other day and there's a woman in San Diego who's developing, she does AI stuff and facial recognition stuff. And there's another university somewhere in Canada who's taking the work that she's doing and then turning it into teaching games for children with autism to teach them how to recognize facial expressions. And wow. I can only imagine that people who are kind of self-taught Ruby rails They'll never get into problems like that. I mean, you can shovel a website like the best of them, but you will not be creating games to teach social skills to children with autism. Yeah, I totally agree. There, there's, there are just, um, it, it's inspiration. So you can draw your inspiration from different places. And I think there are, there's a lot to learn from, from science as well. And there are very interesting things that you can then apply as this beautiful example shows uh, to things that really help other people. So I think there's a lot of value in that. There's a lot of concepts. Like when we talked with, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name, Tom, uh, the, the, the last book club on understanding computability mm -hmm. um, or understanding computation rather. He talked a lot about how, just knowing whether something is decidable or not is really useful outside of computer science and outside of, of other things. And so I think I have to agree with Avdi. I've been kind of the, the source of some of that. Like I've, I've stated publicly several times in the past that the best programmers I've ever worked with did not have degrees in computer science, that they got a degree mm -hmm. in like some engineering field and then they went into that engineering field and became programmers. And so when it came time for them to write a program to manage, you know, a frequency modulator, they knew all of the engineering behind modulating frequencies. And all they had to do was learn enough programming to control the thing. And if you sat a computer programmer down, you know, somebody with a computer science degree, sure, they know about big O notation and they know about, you know, how to program in Java and they know, you know, a little bit about theory but they don't know any of the physics or the engineering behind it. And so they end up uh, writing very efficient programs that do the wrong thing. Yeah. And definitely. my experience with everyone I've worked with that has gone on to do advanced graduate work in computer science has been a fascinating person to sit down and talk with because those are the people that understand, right? Like they've actually gone out and written, you know, a database engine or they've gone out and they've written, you know, engineering code or something, you know, they've actually gotten their feet wet and touched some things and then come back and actually really ground hard on the science. And that's, that's when I think it starts to, starts to pay off. I guess I've, I've, what I'm saying is I've updated my opinion of computer science education that the break even point is some, somewhere past bachelor's degree, you know, a four year university mm -hmm. education. But then it starts paying off in big when, when somebody's got a master's degree or, or a PhD in computer science. These are the people that can sit down. They can look at, you know, the entire programming team of, you know, junior programmers is having a really hard time, you know, getting control over, you know, this, this frequency modulation system or whatever. And it's the guy who can sit down and take one look at it and go, that's because it's not a Galois set and you are trying to use Galois transformations. You have to, you yeah. know, you know, and, and he'll, he'll, he'll just say, fix it this way. And all the programmers go, oh yeah, why didn't we think of that? Well, because, you don't have a doctorate in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So uh, in my bachelor degree, I, I think I didn't learn a, really a lot of it that was in interesting. Just like groundwork, like math, a lot of math, really a lot of math. And I really liked math before I started studying. Uh, and now I don't. But uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it, it helps you in later topics that you can then probably choose depending on the university you are at uh, and yeah I think there's a lot of resources right now and we, we discuss this a lot at, at universities so there's a computer chair that looks at e-learning and w what the con consequences would be for the classic university and I think they will coexist for a long long time because 
uh, e-learning uh, is really useful. So people can learn um, amazing things from MIT, uh, MIT's uh, AI um, lecture, for example. But um, for me, at, le at least, is that a, uh, is that a specific lecture or a series of lectures or what? Yeah, at MIT they have a, an excellent lecture about um, artificial intelligence, uh, and yeah, I haven't attended it yet, but I plan to when I'm done with mm. studying. Um, so yeah, just over the air in on the on the computer uh, because it's it's uh, a lot of people say it's the best uh, AI lecture that exists. Mm. So. I think there, there's a lot of value in that, but for me at least, it's it's hard to motivate motivate myself to go through an entire uh, lecture when I'm not at university. Maybe, right. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's my personal problem, but um, yeah, I, I think uh, university helps a little bit with that. Yeah, I've certainly made some abortive attempts at get it going through some of these um, lecture series that are available online, and I, I never get through yeah. it. And um, when when I was at a conference this year, there was a guy called Sam Aaron, um, and he does a project called Overtone. Do you know that? It sounds that's, familiar. Uh, that's um, a, a, an amazing project where you can program music uh, in Clojure. Hmm. So he had two talks. Uh, in the first talk, he explained what he does and how he configured his Emacs to be a live coding, live music uh, instrument. And the second talk was a concert with uh, his brother-in-law, uh, and they played music. And this is actually uh, his um, work for his doctor's degree. So hmm. uh, he explores how to teach w uh, music with um, coding. And I think it's a fascinating topic. And he's a fascinating guy uh, and a very nice guy. And I think that those things are very valuable if they fall out of university because they are, you can do stupid things in university and you don't get, uh, yeah, you don't uh, go broke uh, because you will be paid by university. And there is a lot of studying that will go nowhere, but um, maybe it will go somewhere interesting. But uh, in, if it was uh, just a project paid by a company, co the company would maybe not be able to pay that. So I think that's one of the values of our current system. Mm -hmm. Are there any ideas you've run across uh, during your studies that you just wish more programmers you knew understood? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I often face people that they heard about Turing machines and they maybe read a short blog post about it and they think they have understood how the, the, the halting problem works, for example. Uh, and they will make assumptions based on that, um, which are maybe not entirely correct. Uh, and I think that the book uh, on uh, from Tom Stewart will help a lot of people. And I think a lot of people that did not have uh, did not do computer science uh, studying should probably read this book mm -hmm. for some of those um, interesting basic ideas because. I don't think the way that we do computing uh, will change for some time uh, in this very basic form. So it probably helps to understand it. I was absolutely one of those people. I had a trivial understanding of Turing completeness and, you know, Turing equivalence and Turing machines. And uh, when I went through understanding computation, it Really, I mean, I, I had about 80% of it, but that 20% was based on some incorrect assumptions. And I figured I had a really clever solution to the halting problem, which was just don't let people write the program that emits the inverse of whatever the previous program <laughs> wrote, and then you're fine. And um, <laughs> that displays a fundamental lack of comprehension of the halting problem. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that a lot of people they they just say like, uh, okay, uh, it, the problem means that I can't tell if this program will ever stop, but I can see that this program will stop, and mm -hmm. I'm like, that's not the whole thing, problem, my friend. Right. Right. Um, so uh, I think uh, this book helps a lot. Can you explain what the halting problem is? <laughs> okay, I I wasn't prepared for that. So uh, the halting problem is basically the the question if you can write a program that can tell you for every other program, including itself, if this program will ever stop its calculations. Uh, so um, there might be programs uh, which can very fast answer, okay, what you asked me is true, but if the que the answer to the question is it it is false 
then it will take an indefinite uh, amount of time or it will take a very long t uh, amount of time and you will never know if uh, the program is just running forever or yeah maybe there is no solution cool thank you no problem <laughs> yeah and I, th I think that that tom stewart did a great job i i haven't uh, ha yet had the time to read it entirely i just flew over the pages and looked at the examples and they were really um yeah uh, they he chose excellently so uh, i can just tell everyone uh, read this book because uh, it will probably um help in some misunderstandings so you program in, in ruby and javascript uh any other languages uh that you are interested in yeah, I'm uh, one of those Haskell people. <laughs> so oh, uh, I gotta go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go count my hair. <laughs> no, I'm 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 really interested in, in a lot of different program languages. It's one of those uh, things that's just interesting to me. How, how do you implement a program language? Uh, how do different program languages, um, yeah, work and how do they understand, uh, how do, would you solve this problem in different languages? And one of the first languages that is not like the normal languages like Java, Ruby and so on it was Haskell for me. And it was really fascinating to see this entirely different view on the world. And in the same way, Prolog, which is like a logic programming language, um, is uh, really fascinating. So I had a lecture about both Haskell and Prolog, where we first um, learned the language, and then the uh, the um, professor told us how the language works and how you would implement it. And in uh, in the Haskell lecture, we implemented a subset of Haskell in Haskell. And in <laughs> Prolog, uh, we implemented the subset of Prolog and Prolog. Mm -hmm. uh, and this um, helps you to, yeah, just see the world in a different way. And I really like languages which do that. So I'm also fascinated by Clojure uh, mm -hmm. for the same reason. But I, yeah, time is a limited amount. And uh, as you <laughs> <laughs> maybe have, have seen, there are quite a few projects I'm working on right now. So Yeah, I was just yeah. looking over yeah. your... Uh... <laughs> Your GitHub program, uh, profile, and you do have a lot going on. I was curious if you had anything in, in Haskell or, um, no, or anything. unfortunately not. They are, uh, like mini programs, which are just laying around on my computer. And mm -hmm. I, I one day thought that maybe I will just push up a snippets folder where there are just snippets of code. But, hmm, is there a lot of senses that I, I don't really know? <laughs> so, uh, there are mainly like Ruby projects and JavaScript projects on, on my GitHub profile. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the other stuff that you're working on. So uh, we talked about the Arango DB stuff, but you have a few other projects too, don't you? Yeah, Ryan. So there are two that are directly related, like Ashikawa Core, which is the groundwork for an adapter to Arango DB, and uh, Guacamole, uh, which is an um, ORM or ODM for um, Arango DB. Uh, they are both Ruby projects. And then uh, one of the projects I'm working a lot on is uh, hacking or, ha uh, yeah, I, it's unpronounceable, unfortunately. So it's <laughs> hacking without A. <laughs> and uh, this is the, the um, community project I told you about, like um, the, the um, event calendar for nerds. And it's a Rails project. I, yeah, sometimes like to do some Rails because I'm not doing a lot of Rails as a Ruby programmer. That's unusual. And mm -hmm. I don't want to lose touch with the rails and still know how it works. So this is a nice project for that. It's a little bit chaotic. So <laughs> we're trying to, uh, yeah, get it in, in shape a little bit. So yeah, <laughs> there are some parts in there which are not the best code I've ever written. <laughs> what? <laughs> a programmer releasing open source code that isn't the best ever? <laughs> yeah, right. That, that, that. It's That's, unimaginable. I actually consider that a fundamental victory of open source. As as somebody who spent 15 years working heavily, heavily, heavily in closed source code, when I first got into open source, I had this deep abiding shame about publishing my code before it was perfect. And yeah. somebody basically just said, just get over yourself and just publish it. And if it's crap, then somebody else can fix it. And we've got that, that open source notion of never complain, only fix, right? Mm. And it was so freeing. 
And suddenly I was able to move so much faster and get stuff out there that was good enough and leave it behind. And I don't consider that a defect. I consider that absolutely a feature when somebody says, yeah, this code isn't not exactly where I want it to be. Well, great. The whole point of open sourcing it was so that other people could use it and improve it. Uh, I absolutely agree. There, there is. Um, if everyone just writes the best open source code there is, everyone will feel bad for their normal code. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> doesn't help a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I look at my open source code and I feel fantastic about my good code. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really bad about my code, and I'm terribly embarrassed about it. But then I just tell myself that I, I, I have to just ignore that and and let it be. But I had one experience this summer that made me really happy that I actually released bad code into the wild because a person told me while I was at a conference that I would get fired from GitHub on the assumption that I don't actually ship code. I only care about code being beautiful. So I would spend all of my time writing emo code and never actually get anything <laughs> shipped. <Wow. laughs> yeah, that's true. There's a lot of danger in that. And um, I played around with exorcism IO, which is an excellent project. Uh, thank you for that. Thank and uh, I, there, there's the, the same thing. So if you do this in everyday work, you will never get anywhere. It's just, uh, yeah, you will improve your code and improve your code, improve your code, and you will never reach and uh, re- reach anything. But I think sometimes it, it helps to think about like a small piece of code, which will be like the best code you can write. But not every piece of code needs to be the best code you, you can write. So, and if you look back like half a year, you will always see like, oh, I would do this totally different now. <laughs> and if I look back one year, yeah, I maybe get sad sometimes about my old code. But I think this is just, yeah, moving forward, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, I just started working with exorcism this week and it's kind of fun because, uh, we, we've been talking in some recent episodes about how to learn and how to practice and how to, you know, how to get better at things. And we talked about exorcism. Katrina, it was, she had it in beta when uh, we were at the rogues retreat and we goofed off and, you know, I came up with a pretty evil solution and James came up with a spectacularly evil solution. I still giggle at what he did to the very first problem. And, I sat down this week and I was going to write the evil solution and then I thought, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to try and write the best possible, most perfect code that I could. And Mm. I ended up vastly over-engineering it and that was fun and I got to learn about it and I got to, you know, find that line between writing a kludgy hack and over-architecting. There's, you can go either way. You can be, you can do something too simple. And it can be very simple and appropriate to the problem scope, and yet it can be too simple for, you know, it can be basically bad code, and so it needs to be cleaned up and architected a little bit better. But you can go completely off the other end. And so, in theory, I've gone through like five iterations of the Bob project, which is the very first one, and it's been really easy and really simple. And I could just say, yeah, you know what, I'm done. I'm ready for the next problem. But I want to do it perfectly just so that I can have had the practice of having done it perfectly. And I, it's, it's not work. I'm not getting paid by the hour to do this. So I can afford to spend 40, 50 hours writing 30 lines of code and agonizing over every single line. And it helps me later because I, then I go back to work and now I am being paid by the hour, but I've had practice throwing out this pattern or favoring this other thing because of this practice and you get to you get to access that and, and and bring it forward and so it's it's just astonishingly valuable definitely that i was doing something similar so i'm, I'm working on a little project called exogenesis uh which uh, should help you uh, build better uh, better, uh, better installers and updaters for your dot files mm-hmm. and i mm-hmm. um read across uh, this project i i think that, uh, we you talked about it like dev tools from the um, Data Mapper 2 ROM team. It's like um, yeah, a collection of tools to measure your code quality and and so on. And um, mm-hmm. mutation testing, which uh, yeah was, I think, mentioned in one episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I extracted a part of exogenesis, uh, the part that just prints out stuff on the on the terminal. And I wanted to make it perfectly tested. So I 
uh, started up with with dev tools and um, mutation testing from day one and I wanted to have 100% mutation testing and mm-hmm. all the metrics should be the best they ever been and um, I'm yeah I'm not really far into the project because yeah. I'm just writing so much code and rethinking and mm-hmm. refactoring and I'm not getting very fast um, with it but yeah. uh, I, it's an excellent learning um, learning thing because there it will tell you like uh, if you, I delete this line of code your tests will never notice it so. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, I see that in this exp- uh, this code, then I uh, maybe I don't want to use mutant in my in, in all of my projects. But I now know that maybe in my other projects I have to take a closer look at c- code like that and um, see if maybe I do this mistake over and over again and don't test this special case, for example. Yeah. And I think yeah, there are a lot of things like just experimenting and things like exorcism, which will just help you understand code better and maybe write your real code uh, better. Yeah, so. absolutely. I my, one of my early submissions to the Bob uh, project, I monkey patched array, and <laughs> and I modified the delete at method. So I mean, I not it, it's a true monkey patch. I am replacing an existing method on array and. I'm of the opinion, I, and I argued this, I think successfully on, on exorcism, that what I wanted to do was delete at and then give a test block that would find the element that I wanted to delete. And <laughs> delete at takes the index. It does not take a block. Index will take a block and return the index. So if you want to delete at a block, what you have to do is array dot delete at and then you give it you know, array.index block, and, and that'll work. But it's repetitive, and it, it looks bad. And so I, I built a version of delete at that takes a block. And if no block is given, it calls the old version of delete at. And if a block was given, then it calls index, or it passes the block to index, gets that number back, and then calls the old version of delete at. And I argued very passionately that this makes the core API better and that it is, it deserves to be in core. It should not be in a decorator. It should not be in a delegator. It should live in core. It really is. Uh, and it shouldn't be inheritance either because of the, the problems. I'll post the link in the show notes. Uh, Steve Klabnik's, uh, Katrina actually gave me this link. Steve Klabnik wrote a great blog post about don't subclass core data types because the C code will sometimes make assumptions about yeah. the classes. And if you subclass it, you can actually have like memory leaks happening because your class type has changed and the C code makes assumptions about the classes. But I argued very passionately that this core cl- core monkey patch was valid and was good and that it should live in core. And I am telling the reader Ruby is wrong and this makes Ruby more right. And I, I argued that if I were going to put this in a large production suite, I absolutely would not do it without making absolutely certain that everybody on the team knew it was there and then I would pull the entire test suite out of Ruby for Array and mm. put it into the application to test my monkey patch to, ass- to assert that Arrays still acted 100% like Arrays. And the reason why I think of this is that you mentioned mutation testing, and I haven't played with mutation testing in a long, long time. But now that I think about it, I would throw in mutation testing on a core monkey patch as well. Basically, you know, this has to have 100% coverage and full mutation testing to guarantee that every line is asserted deliberately and discreetly in the core test suite. Otherwise, you cannot monkey patch core. You're not allowed. You know, it's just too dangerous. We have to have absolute trust that this method works the way we expect it to. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that a project like Ruby Spec uh, helps a lot if you really want to monkey patch and you think it's a good idea mm-hmm. to check uh, if you don't break anything really essential, mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, things that everyone that uses Ruby expects to work. So yeah, <laughs> probably a good idea. Yeah. Uh, another kudo for exorcism. This is turning into the exorcism show. Um, another kudo <laughs> for exorcism was that I finally pulled the monkey patch out because uh, I think it was actually Katrina that argued your code isn't readable. <laughs> you know, it's you, you've written an eight line monkey patch on a core class, which, you know, makes everybody's tail go all bushy. And you did it to remove like 12 characters off of one line of code. So readability wise, you sacrificed eight lines to save 10% on one line. I'm like, yeah, this is unreadable. I had to go sleep on it though. 
before I could come back and and say, okay, 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 I'll take out my monkey patch. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the mo- most people that do their first um, submission to exorcism, they um, will just fire anything off and say, okay, the test passes, it's okay. And then they will notice that there are real people that will <laughs> read their code and yeah. try to understand it. And then uh, funny things happen and you will get into arguments with people and <laughs> say, you are so wrong. Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I think I my, my Bob code, code had eight or nine iterations and now I really like the code. So yeah, I could could try out a, a thing that I haven't tried, uh, didn't try out before, like Stabby Lambdas for case statements. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I really enjoy just putting a little bit of code somewhere and and seeing if, if it works, if other people understand it, and um, yeah, push down the things that are not so interesting and not so so important for the reader uh, to understand your code. Yeah, Lucas, I have a, a question for you, and if you don't have an answer to that to this, that's fine. We'll just edit it out. Since we 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 brought you on the show, I want to give you a chance to sort of you know. Take advantage of that that pulpit. Is there is there anything yeah. that Ruby programmers aren't thinking about that they should be thinking about, in your opinion? Okay, so, so that's a very general question. Yes. Or, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I hear a lot of discussions about people that uh, really enjoy functional programming, and uh, yeah, as I said before, I really enjoy it as well. And they try to use the same techniques in, in Ruby. Which mm-hmm. is kind of dangerous because we don't have tail call optimization and other things in the language which are necessary for certain kinds of things that you want to do in a functional programming language. And I think that people should, uh, if they really want to try out functional programming, uh, they should go to a real functional programming language and try it out there. And I think it will help people with misunderstandings about functional programming. I, I mm-hmm. gave a, a long talk. I think I planned for 20 minutes, but I gave like 50 minutes uh, of talk about functional programming as, at my local Ruby user group. And yeah, a lot of people, they said like, ah, okay, now now I understand what what this means because I learned functional programming from the perspective of theoretical computer scientists and i think this perspective is different from yeah people that just want to make their code run parallel in parallel and there are other techniques like the actor model which um, can be implemented very very nicely in, in ruby and um, maybe we shouldn't just try to copy everything from other languages <laughs> so it's not Does all about ent- just getting. Does this your question or? Uh... Yeah, well, no, I think yeah, I think, and I think that opens up some some uh, some great follow ups. Um, <laughs> okay. So so I guess so. What, one of the things you're, it sounds like you're saying is is functional programming is worth it getting into, and not just so that you can make code run on multiple cores. Yeah, definitely. So um, when when there are problems where I see that they are have a mathematical nature, they are not mathematical. I'm not a mathematician, and I don't solve like big calculations or something like that, or prove some theorems. But there are problems where I see a just a parallel to a mathematical problem, and I can express them very well in Haskell. So um, I, I think you can learn to express things differently and this will make you think harder about which is the right tool for the job so if uh, for example you have a problem and it's better to to solve it in haskell maybe there is a situation where you shouldn't use ruby you should maybe use something else even though you really like ruby like i do um Mm -hmm. so changing your perspective do you have like a, a specific example of a problem that you found easier to model in haskell Oh, um, I, I had, um, we discussed, yeah, I, I think it was <laughs> quite a, quite funny. Um, we, we discussed a problem, uh, where, uh, a, d- a designer asked us, uh, for, there was like 200 pixel wide area and we should find the best way to split it in different, uh, sections. Uh, how wide should those sections be? And, uh, we sat down and we tried it in Ruby and uh, it kind of worked. And I was like, huh, 
But this was kind of a lot of code to express that. And I retried that in Haskell and it was just very, very natural to express it. And even though most of the people there didn't know Haskell, they could still understand the code. So uh, I think there, uh, yeah, we are faced with different problems that have mathematical nature because computers are, yeah, things that compute stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this uh, sometimes helps. I think now might be a good time for me to, to point out that, you know, I, I teased you earlier about Haskell and right now all of our listeners that do Haskell are, you know, kind of bristling at me for having done that. And I just, I just want to take this opportunity to say, I'm glad you feel bad. Uh, you know what you did and, you know, no, no in, in seriousness, uh, uh Haskell is uh, a language that is, very powerful for uh, mathematical computing as well. Uh, a friend of mine and I did Project Euler together. Yeah, right. And I was doing them in Ruby, and he was doing them in Haskell. And invariably, his solutions were shorter, more elegant, more to the point. Uh, I thought mine were more readable, and you know, I kind of liked mine more. But that's because I like Ruby, and I'm not adept at Haskell. I tried to learn it, and I couldn't get my head wrapped around like monads and that sort of thing. And so uh, our current book club book is uh, Functional Programming for the Object-Oriented Programmer by Brian Merrick. And it's being a godsend for you know somebody who's just rigidly stuck in the OO and, and procedural thinking. It's a great book to kind of unhinge your mind a little bit and say, okay, here's here's how some of the world thinks, and it's very different than the way you're used to. Yeah, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this. I had, I didn't read the book yet. I plan to. Uh, I think there, uh, there's also a coupon code. Maybe I should get the book fast. <laughs> um, and, um, really interested in that because there are a lot of diff uh, people that say we should, um, learn from functional programming. They mean a lot of different things because functional programming means a lot of different things to different mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Uh, there it's just, yeah, it's like no SQL. It's just a word that mm -hmm. has so many meanings that it doesn't have a meaning at all. Yeah. Uh, and if I tell you what my definition of functional programming is, there will be 10,000 people who tell me that I'm totally wrong and right. that doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's more like a way of thinking probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, um, a set of ideas. Yeah. Well, and, and there are ideas that trans that transfer really well to Ruby, like, like making sure yeah. your methods don't have any side effects is really, really good. Making sure that your methods are, or that your data objects are immutable, a little bit harder in Ruby and, and stresses the Ruby VM a little bit more because you're, you're creating so many extra copies of things, uh, because the language isn't quite as directly designed for that way of being, but you can do it. And like you said, if you're going to go overboard with, F with FP, maybe, maybe use an FP language. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the, the immutability. I, I see that there are people uh, who write libraries to emulate uh, immutability in Ruby. And this is nice for understanding your code, but all the performance benefits you get, um, yeah, they don't work if the language is not designed to work yeah. like this. Yeah, so. that's that's been a concern of mine as well. I mean, it's really it's having the form but denying the power thereof. Uh, to, <laughs> yeah. To get yes. a little biblical, you know, they're they're neat exercises. I, I've I've looked at a lot of these things. They're really neat exercises, and I think they're they're cool as as you say as a way means to understand. But you're not gonna reap the benefits and it's just yeah it's not the same as when you actually you know are forced to to just shift over completely to the functional mindset yeah um, i'm curious if you have an if you have an opinion you know if let's say i'm a i'm a listener and i'm mainly just working in ruby and i want to try a functional language of course the 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 book club book as dave mentioned is brian merrick's book and that one uses closure examples but i'm curious if you have an opinion what's a good functional language to get started with yeah, so um, I I discussed this a lot with uh, with people, and there are a lot of people that suggest uh, Lisp and uh, or Lisp and Scheme, and I think that they are not a good way to get started because they are not pure functional programming languages, right. and they will not keep you from doing things that are not functional. So you, if you want to understand what this means, then you probably should use a language which enforces it and. Uh, for me, the strongest one is, is Haskell, but it's a little bit hard to get into it. 
I think that Clojure, even though it's a Lisp, has a lot more of those ideas from functional programming. It's like a lot closer to Haskell than most yeah. Lisps. Yeah. The, the, the thing I'm, I'm missing in, in Clojure is a good pattern matching, which is amazing in Haskell. Mm, but, yeah. uh, yeah, that's the reason is that the syntax is so simple that it doesn't really look nice because Haskell was designed to, yeah, look good with pattern matching. And I would just say try out Haskell, but I'm not sure which resource is the best. So you could, for example, do it in Exorcism, and uh, there's uh, our Haskell tutorials as well. Uh, there's a Haskell track as well. But um, if you want to learn the the basics, there is this uh, learning Hask. No, um, I forgot the name, but there is a very popular book uh, which is free on the internet. Um, is it but uh, I- learn learn you a Haskell for great good? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people really like it. I didn't like it a lot. Uh, I have a book. I will put it in the show notes. I can't remember the name right now, which I enjoyed a lot, but it's a little bit more mathematical, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think it's an excellent introduction. Um, it's a short book, and uh, you can get through it very fast. It's, I think, from one of the guys b- behind uh, Haskell, because they are like, Ten people that are in the Haskell core mm-hmm. community from the beginning. Those books always those books <laughs> always scared me because you know when I when I got started with Haskell many years ago there there weren't as many resources available online and uh, and I got started with the gentle introduction to Haskell. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It was not, I don't not, think so. Not quite a whole book, more of a paper. Oh, long okay. Paper, but the name was clearly ironic because it was about as gentle as a kick in the face. Um, <laughs> I think it was gentle. If you happen to already know ML really well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which are like five people on the yard. Right. So, so yeah, like some of the, the earlier books that were more mathematically oriented always scared me, but I'll have to take a look at the one that, that you suggest. I know another one that people often talk about is real world Haskell. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that's probably another one that's more focused on getting things done and less focused on understanding the sort of mathematical mindset. Yeah. I, I think that the, the um, the the thing that this book which uh, i will yeah put in the show notes um is really good at is showing you the philosophy and uh, how it can uh, yeah how the programs that you write are more expressive mm-hmm. and uh, learn you le- uh, uh, practical uh, haskell uh, or everyday haskell or i forgot the name it tries to start gently and uh, wants to keep monads from you and i think uh, there are a million ways to explain monads and nobody yeah really uh, understands what the other people are talking about i hear monads and, are like a walrus eating a taco <laughs> i heard they are like desks and they are like uh, carpets and uh, yeah i heard like <laughs> 5000 different ways to explain them and this book it will just show you how what you have to do to uh, get a side effect in Haskell, and after that it will tell you, by the way, you just use the monad. And I think this yeah. is the least scary way to do it, because if, if this, the word is so scary, monad, it sounds like something Latin and it's, old. It sounds, and, I always think of mononucleosis of the gonads, and that's <laughs> not... <laughs> That's the first thing you're thought I, thinking about. I know that's not right, but just listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think dirty things when I hear the word monad. It's I think that's part of I, I genuine. I, I'm not kidding. I genuinely think that's part of why I have a hard time wrapping my head around the word and around the concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe that that doesn't help a lot if you have such a <laughs> crazy word in your head, but um. I, I, I don't know, there, this is a tendency of functional programming which, uh, um, yeah, doesn't help in bringing it to more people that they think about diff- uh, um, crazy words for everything and they sound very, uh, technical or very, um, mathematical and, uh, bas- basically they are just simple concepts and if they had a simpler name, people would be so scared about them, I think. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I think if you use Haskell, then a lot of those concepts will come very natural to you. And if someone just comes to you later and says, oh, by the way, uh, this is a closure, uh, then you will not be scared because the word, yeah, you, you will understand what the word means and not uh, be scared of just the word. Definitely. And yeah, I mean, I definitely agree about 
uh, learning Haskell to to understand that functional mindset. It certainly helped me. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think if you try Haskell and after that go to Clojure, then you will have a different perspective on it, and maybe um, yeah, it will be easier for you to understand certain things. And Clojure is probably the more practical tool. So if you really want to get uh, something done in a functional programming language, you should use Clojure. But if you want to understand the concept, then you should use Haskell because. Yeah, I don't think there are a lot of companies in the world which use Haskell for something real world. Um, and there are reasons for that because, yeah, it gets really messy if the projects get bigger. And yeah, that's an interesting point. And yeah, I could see where that would be true. Yeah. And I, I never wrote a, yeah, the most complex Haskell program I wrote was the implementation of the subset of Haskell. <laughs> and, uh, it started to get very messy and um, we tried to refactor it, but refactoring in Haskell is, yeah, not so much fun. Which and is weird. I guess it's, yeah. it, it, it ought to be, it ought to be okay because it's a language that's so, that is able to know so much about itself at compile time that you ought to be able to have, you know, automated tools to really easily do refactoring. But I guess that's sort of one of the trade-offs between Haskell and, and your, your average Lisp is, that you can write these really quick and dirty tools to refactor Lisp pretty easily because because the representation is the is the AST. Yeah, yeah. So um, the the this is what what is really beautiful about Lisp is uh, that it's so simple. The the syntax is so simple, and that you can if you manipulate the the um, syntax, it will be much more natural than it is probably in Ruby, for example. But uh, yeah, and Haskell doesn't have this kind of um, features it uh, yeah it's kind of static and it has uh, yeah it ha- has types and so on but it's a great teacher and it yeah will just um, let you think more about the code you just wrote so yeah. I think it's a valuable lesson for for everyone um, to to try it not to use it in a real pro program but just to write a little program with it and just try for the first time to print something to the console <laughs> for example, <laughs> um, which is technically a side effect, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and so technically, it doesn't matter. Hey, that's, yeah. <laughs> side effect is, by the way, a very uh, uh, awful word, which is misleading in my opinion because it sounds like it doesn't matter what a side effect does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, Side effect is basically. And coincidentally, this program also launches the missiles, but that's just a side effect. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So also, which is what, what is uh, really interesting about Haskell is the way it handles types. So I started with, uh, actually I started with flash programming, but, uh, the first real program language was Java for me. And I really started to hate types and type <laughs> languages. And I thought that all typed languages will be awful. And when I discovered Ruby, I was like, yes, this is awesome. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and when I then discovered Haskell, I saw this different approach to types and how they can actually help you and not just be this thing that you have to write several times, like uh, car, car equals to new car. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. What? Uh, and uh, because it uses type inference, it's not more work to to write, but it will give give you um, yeah, it will give you confidence in your code, uh, and um, also you you will express certain things with types instead of uh instead of the function names, and this is quite interesting and a different approach than you have in other programming languages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, and. It certainly, I mean, it, it, I don't know. It makes you think a little harder about like the the data types that you're using. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, you know, you, what are their valid ranges and stuff like that? Yeah, and uh, they they have crazy concepts about testing, uh, which are yeah different from the way that we do testing in, in Ruby, for example. Uh, like fast check, I think is the name of the program, which will quick check like, like the quick check, right? Quick check, yeah. which uh, is just a crazy concept and which would never work in a language like Ruby, <laughs> but just to try it out, it's, it's amazing. And again, it will teach you like TDD teaches you. It will teach you uh, different things about programming. 
It always seemed like those tools, like the quick checks, kind of were a totally different arena of testing than unit. It seemed like they're kind of orthogonal, almost. Yeah. I mean, there. It seems to me, unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, it seems to me they're only applicable to function. You know, to very functional functions. You know, things that are just like <laughs> a a simple function of inputs to outputs. I don't know. I look at that sometimes and I think, okay, I can I could definitely see stress. You know, putting some basic functions through their paces with this, but it's, it's hard to see how this is going to help me verify my website. Yeah, that, that's true. The quick check is only usable if you have functions in the mathematical sense. So uh, you're mapping something to something else and nothing, nothing is happening uh, while you are doing that. So no side effects. And otherwise it is kind of awkward to use quick check. But uh, yeah, I, I I've never written bigger amounts of code with uh, and tested them with quick check. Mm-hmm. But I think it's interesting. I think this was also ported to Clojure recently, or not so recently. Maybe this can work there too for certain yeah. functions. Yeah, there's been a lot of crossover. I know that Clojure is getting um is getting some optional types as well. Yeah, in the beginning when I heard about Clojure, I'm, I was like, ah, okay, so it's just common Lisp and it's running in the JVM. Uh, what's new about that? <laughs> so, um, I ignored it for a while because I thought that it will be as successful as common Lisp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there, but there are really interesting concepts about it, like the immutability, um, that will that make it an interesting language and uh the the people that are behind closure they are not such deep believers in the purity of the lisp like uh, never introduce any syntax at all uh they introduce square brackets which is like uh deadly sin uh for a lisp <laughs> program i think yes uh, i think this gives you uh, gives a lot of opportunity to um, I think they they also commit the heresy of not using car and cutter to refer to the first and first and rest of a list. Yeah, are they not available, or I think they are just an alias or something? And people were the, the really funny thing mad is even that. even common Lisp has had first and rest as aliases for car and cutter for a long time. Yeah, um, but uh, <laughs> but nobody actually used them. Yeah, because you can't do da 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 it's it's like common list programmers wonder why nobody likes them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if if list used first and rest, you'd still have the same problem because pe- they, people would come in and say, "Yeah, we need to get the for At this point, I think we've probably lost like ninety five percent of the listeners. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Picks maybe the second item. The second <laughs> item in a list is referred to as the effort. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Next okay. week on the Polyglot Programmer podcast, <laughs> I, I just wanted to clarify that I don't uh, dislike common Lisp. It just has a difficult uh, heritage because it, yeah, it is. There's more than one way to do it in Ruby does mean something entirely different for a common uh, Lisp programmer because there are a thousand ways to do everything in common <laughs> Lisp because they uh, unified, I think, a, a six ma- uh, course standards at that time and mm-hmm. added like 10 more. Uh, and therefore, for every function, there are 10 aliases and everyone will tell you something different is the one way to do it. So. Yeah. I think we, the Ruby community, have mostly have like two different ways to do something, mm-hmm. and they have five or six. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Python says there's one right way to do it. Ruby says there's multiple ways to do it, but one of them is probably the best for any given situation. Perl says there's more than one way to skin a cat, and Common Lisp says there's no wrong way to do it, really. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good way to to, to describe it. All right, so picks other than common Lisp. Let's start with uh, Katrina. I have so many picks today. Please excuse me. So my first one, Rich Hickey did a talk called Simple Made Easy. It's really, really good. It talks about the difference between simple and simplicity as being a subjective measure and easy as being 
so, I'm sorry, the opposite. Simple is an objective measure of how interleaved something is or the lack thereof. So it's the opposite of complexity, whereas easy is an, a subjective measure that can be anything from it's close at hand or it's familiar to me. And because we talked about readability a couple times during the show, I felt that this was very relevant. Uh, we talked about Ruby versus Haskell being used to solve Euler uh, project uh, problems. And David said that he found that the Ruby was more readable. And I would argue that that's a function of familiarity more than oh, anything else. Absolutely. Um, so that was uh, Rich Hickey, Simple Made Easy. The second thing, I was talking to a friend about certain things that, that we both find complicated or awkward. And this really funny thing came up. We both find that this whole thing, concept of eye contact during a conversation is difficult for completely different reasons. And I found a website that will teach you social skills, among them how to make eye contact. So the website is improveyoursocialskills.com, and uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. My third pick is Temple Grandin, who is a real person, but there's a movie from 2010 that is really, really, really good. It's biographical, it's beautiful, it's funny, it's inspiring, it's poignant, and it just, I don't know. I love the movie, but I also love this person, Temple Grandin. She's She has a PhD in animal science. Um, she lives out here in Colorado, I think, and she is has high-functioning autism, and she's a visual thinker. So she she has this completely different way of processing the world. And it's absolutely fascinating. And a follow on pick to that is a TED talk that she did called Different Kinds of Mind. Um, that is also just really interesting. And that's what I have. Cool. I um, mm -hmm. will just throw some, something in there. So there's uh, an excellent blog post from the changelog. Uh, which lists a few more of Rich Hickey's uh, talks, uh, including this one. And it's a really uh, amazing list. Uh, so uh, you should maybe watch some other talks as well. David, what are your, your picks? Uh, I've just got two today. Tinyhabits.com. I thought I had picked this months ago when I picked Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit. And I didn't. Uh, so I'm picking it now. So tinyhabits.com. What this is is a website that will walk you through establishing a tiny little micro habit. His entire premise is basically if you want to establish a habit like brushing your teeth, you set a trigger event that will happen immediately before you need to do the habit. You make the habit as small and painless as possible. Like you just say, I'm just going to brush one teeth, one tooth. That's all I have to do. And I get credit for having done it. And then you immediately give yourself a small immediate reward after having done it. Whether it's, you know, go play ukulele for 15 minutes or whether it's just look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're awesome. You finally did it. And what you do is you go out to his website uh, every week before, I think, Sunday afternoon. It might be Saturday afternoon. And you sign up and it puts you on the mailing list for seven days. And what he did, does is he lets you write down the three habits that you want to do. Make, and he helps you make sure that they're small and that they have a specific trigger and that they have, you know, a good reward afterwards. And then he emails you every single day and says, did you do it or didn't you do it? And you write back and you respond to the email with YYY or YNY or NNN. And he actually reads all of the mails coming back. And so if you write back YNY, he'll come back and talk to you about your second habit and converse with you about, you know, how to help you establish a better habit and how to how to improve yourself and it's it's fantastic for forming a new habit because he he you stay on the mailing list for seven days and then he stops bothering you and you can you can re-enlist or and for another week or you can just let it go so tinyhabits.com is my first pick it's a lot of fun my second pick is much more involved and complicated but we spent half the show talking about it I cannot believe that exorcism.io has not been picked on the show before Katrina you've you've, you've really just got to learn to be uh, absolutely shameless about plugging your own stuff because exorcism is fantastic. So doggone it, if you won't pick it, I will. And so <laughs> exorcism.io, it's my pick for today. It's it's exorcism spelled with an E-X-E, -E, like exercise. But uh, other than that, it uh, looks like exorcism and the icon even has horns. So 
Uh, it's a fantastic place to go practice your good coding skills or your bad coding skills and be shamed by your friends. <laughs> Uh, my picks today turned out to be kind of topical at a conversation that we had. So I, I'm picking a couple of blog posts from a former guest on the show, uh, just Jessica Kerr or Kerr. I'm not sure how the, I don't remember how the last name is pronounced, but, um, uh, she's got some blog posts on functional programming. Uh, particularly there's this one called from lists to trains to functors and then, uh, another one called trains within trains. And they're, they just, they're beautifully illustrated. They have these great illustrations of, how mapping works and how lazy lists work and stuff like that. And I can't really do them justice because they're visual, but I've been, I've been really enjoying them. Lucas, what are your picks? Uh, it's to, to improve my, uh, uh, yeah, word as a uh, computer science nerd, I will pick a paper. <laughs> so, uh, there's this excellent paper called an eye tracking study on camel case and underscore identifier styles. So, um, Ooh. <laughs> As uh, someone who switches between Ruby and JavaScript uh, very often, and yeah, JavaScript is using uh, camel case and Ruby is using underscore, and I'm always like uh, complaining about this is so stupid, camel case, I hate camel case, and uh, now there um, is proof that the underscore uh, syntax is better than the yes! camel case syntax. So it's uh, much easier to read. So if you just want to, from an eye tracking point of view, it's much faster to to read the methods uh in an underscore uh syntax so uh if you ever have this ar- argument you can throw paper, uh, papers at people so now, if, if only if only somebody would come up with a study that proves that dashes are better than underscores <laughs> i think they are uh yeah they ha- they have some similarities in the eye tracking area and I-, I found them quite quite nice because in the list world uh everyone is losing using um uh, dashes and I find it some I really uh, enjoy it but underscores are uh, excellent as long as you don't use camel case everything's all right so my second pick is uh, teaching kids so uh, what I've done recently uh, is um, helping organize a coder dojo and this is a place for kids to learn about programming and about other uh, computer related stuff um, and maybe just build stuff and it's a lot of fun. And uh, in the vein of the things we talked about today, it, it's really nice to change your perspective uh, to see the world from a kid's point of view. The kid may not care about um, if you, uh, um, yeah, if you adjust your uh, do's and ends, uh, the, it will just have fun drawing stuff on the screen and building robots. And yeah, everyone should try it and teach a kid to program. And my third pick uh, is a game. Uh, this is a game that I'm uh, playing right now on my iPhone because it's a lot of fun. It's called Super Spellboy, and um, I will put a link into the show notes. It's just a good game if you have some minutes to spare if you're waiting for a bus or if you just come home from a long day and just want to uh, shut your brain down for a minute or two. So, yeah, that's my pick. All right, cool. Well, I think that's about it. Just a reminder before we go, the uh, our next book club book is Functional Programming for the Object-Oriented Programmer by Brian Merrick. I think and go buy, go buy yeah, t-shirts. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to say um, there is a um, – if, if you still have a little bit of time to, to get that book and, and uh, read it before we uh, air the show uh, on Christmas. And uh, if you do, there's a $5 off, off code, which is please remember the starving artist, all lowercase with underscores. Not camel case. Nice. So it's readable. <laughs> That's right. And yes, yes, buy t-shirts, booster.com slash Ruby Rogues. Buy one for everyone in your family. Except don't buy too many because I need to, I still need to buy some for my family. <laughs> yeah, like no, seriously, orders. go buy them. There's like 24 orders placed right now and I'm pretty sure 20 of those are us rogues. <laughs> All right, well, Lucas, thank you for, very much for coming on the show. Yes, this was awesome. Yeah, Thanks for thank coming. thank you. This was fun. I, I was happy to join you. I'm listening to the podcast every week, so thank you. Awesome. All right, bye-bye.